I'm going to ask you to all stand. <laughs> stand up. I know you can do it. Uh, turn around and shake hands with somebody or elbow bump, whichever you feel comfortable with. And uh, tell them that you're glad that they're here. Welcome to somebody. Okay. Now we do have hand sanitizer on your way out if you're worried about it. And you might be. I would be. Okay. <laughs> hey, that looks great. Do you feel you feel welcome now? I hope everybody feels welcome. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're back. Some of our some of our members have been with us for a while and we're so glad you're back. Well, it was a day they were going to make chalupas. I don't know if you know what chalupas are, but if you're born in uh, or go to Oklahoma, a chalupa will require a flat, crispy tortilla, some wonderful refried vegetarian beans, no lard, and, uh, and a whole bunch of things chopped up. You know, it looks a lot like a uh, haystack on top of a fried tor tortilla. Well, they were making the chalupas, and uh, the men were in the living room. Well, amongst the men that were in the living room was one of my favorite evangelists. I didn't know him yet. I didn't know him then. But his name was Dan Collins. And he was explaining some things about the law. And I was Martha in the kitchen because all the ladies, you know, sometimes if you're like, be merry, they don't, they're not really happy with you. If you've got to be a Martha sometimes because the Marys um, don't do as much. So I'm in the Martha kitchen with the chalupa chopping and everything, and I hear this going on in the next room, and I said, oh, man, finally, I said afterwards, I said, Dan, you have to tell me what you said. That, that was so, such a revelation to me. I, I, hadn't, I hadn't heard that before. Well, in December, when I brought a little bit of those, uh, this message about what is positive about thou shalt not, some of the ladies said, said to me, would you mind getting that printed out? I want to read that again. I want to be able to see that. And so uh, my husband, and Marty Race, is going to pass you out a little uh, handout. And I don't mind you having it now because I believe you'll... You'll look at it, you'll look at what's on the screen, and we'll all learn some things together. But the answer to what is positive about thou shalt not is kind of on that paper. It's not definitive. I believe that God's going to speak to you and help you find out some more things that are positive about thou shalt not. In Psalm chapter 1 and verse 2, here is a beautiful, beautiful thought. But his delight, would you read it with me? Can you look at the screen and read that one with me? But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, don't you wonder how you can meditate on the law day and night? I wondered. I said, well, uh, I mean, the Ten Commandments, uh, how do you meditate on that? Uh, you think about it, you... You know, I think in Hebrew that the word meditate comes a little bit from the word of a cow chewing its cud. So when you meditate on something, you just kind of, we would say you mull it over, you you uh, re, you just keep thinking about it, you regurgitate it, and then you swallow it again. <laughs> you keep thinking about it over and over. So in his law, does he meditate? How often? Day and night. Day and night. Hmm. Well, in Revelation 22 and verse 4, it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and they enter in through the gates into the city. Bless, can you say that with me? Blessed are they that do his commandments. We'll do the short version there. And this beautiful is found, Ray, you read out of um, chapter 8, right? Look at what's in chapter 10. I read this one with me, please. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Hebrews, let's do the, the where you find it. Hebrews 10 16. 10 16. Hmm. 
I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Is this part of a new experience? Was this something God always wanted to do? Yes. Something God always wanted to do is put the law in our hearts and put our hearts into the law. Interesting thought. Jesus said, and he made it really plain in the new that we would that this would be a New Testament experience as well. Read this one with me from John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Wow. Some people try to reduce those commandments down to almost nothing. But how excited I was to find out that the God who gave the commandments on Mount Sinai was the same God who gave the Sermon of the Mount on the Sermon of the Mount. <laughs> same God. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Wow, how exciting is that? Romans 13, 10 says, if you love others, you will never do them wrong. Do you believe that? If you really love somebody, do you do them wrong? Yeah. So to love, then, is to obey the whole law. Amen. Somebody told me that the Ten Commandments are like your hands. Take your five fingers up, put your hands up in the air. This is a this is an action day. Um, and the first four, uh, they said that they said on the on the law hangs the law and the prophets, right? So you've got your first four, how to love God, and your last six, how to love people. Can you do that? First four, how to love God. Last six, how to love people. So if you love others, including God, you'll never do them wrong. And to love them is to obey the whole law. And love is a motivation you can't force, is it? No. You can't force love. So here's another question. Do we know the commandments? Well, that young rich ruler that came to Jesus in Mark 10 and verse 19, Jesus said to him, Thou knowest the commandments. And he said, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. Those are the ones that tell us how to love who? Others. People. Yeah, people. How to love God and how to love people. So some people say, well, you see the first four in there, so Jesus wasn't talking about those. But he was doing the ones that how to love people part. Very, very not abstract. Something you can see. These all you can see, except perhaps the less the one about coveting. And we'll, we'll get into that. So the Ten Commandments written in stone. And thank you, Janice, so much for setting the tone for our for our, our teaching this morning. Not written with in sand, but written in stone. Not written in um, some kind of sea foam, but in stone. His character of love, those who wait for the bridegroom coming, are to say to the people, Behold your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world, is a revelation of his character of love. And Ellen White wrote that in the Christ Object Lessons on page 415. His character of love. Well, I was hanging around finding out that the Adventists said to me, this is many years ago, that the Ten Commandments revealed, revealed the character of God. And that's where I was when I was in that kitchen with the Chalupa, uh, with the Chalupa KP duty. I was like, the character of God in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not. It did not make sense to me. It was a list of do's and don'ts. And for you, that may have been the case. But listen to this. Ellen G. White again writes in Christ's Object Lessons, page 69. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. What kind of desire? Longing, longing desire. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Amen. Wow. What's Jesus waiting for? Us. What's the Father waiting for? He's waiting for us to look like him. 
look like him, act like him, be like him, to be like Jesus, amen? What would Jesus do? You know, WW, JD, what would Jesus do? It has to be inside our hearts. It has to be inside our hearts in every interaction that we go through, with every person we meet, at all times of the day, whether we're hungry, tired, or angry, whether we're hangry, we're supposed to have the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced. Brothers and brethren and sisters, it's God beholding that we become changed by dwelling upon the love of God and our Savior, by contemplating the perfection of the divine character, and look at how important this is, claiming the righteousness of Christ as ours by faith, we are to be transformed into the same image. When you focus on your problems and on your faults, those are what come out of you. When you focus on the righteousness of Christ by faith, we will be transformed. We are to be transformed into the same image of Christ. Christ, our Savior, the God that you can see, is the God who wrote the Ten Commandments. The same one on the Mount of uh, Transfiguration, the same one that was ascended into heaven, the same one that preached on the Sermon on the Mount. Now this is, could be a problem for us. Listen to this, the meager, that means the small, the tiny, the puny, the puny word views which so many have had of the exalted character and office of Christ. You know, he's my buddy, he's my co-pilot. We put it, we put it into such small examples of what he's really like. He's the risen Savior. You know, he's the exalted God, the Lord of Lord, King of Kings. So if we have had a meager or puny view of the exalted character and office of Christ, we need to widen it up, right? But if we didn't, we have narrowed their religious experience and greatly hindered your pro my, my progression in the divine life. Personal religion, she said, is at an ebb, a low ebb among us as a people. There's much form, much machinery, much tongue religion, but something deeper and more solid must be brought into our religious experience. Now, a lot of people are misrepresenting God's character. It is Satan's constant effort to misrepresent the character of God, the nature of sin. Oh, just a little thing. A white lie. It's Satan's constant effort to misrepresent the character of God, the nature of sin, and the real issues at stake in the great controversy. His sophistry lessens the obligation of the divine law and gives men license to sin because he's misrepresenting the character of God. Oh, God gave you all those thou shalt not, not for safety. He just doesn't want you to have any fun. He doesn't, he doesn't want you to, to, uh, to just experience life however you want it, according to your own creativity. Well, today I'm identifying as a woman just want you to know. <laughs> here we have, here we have um, a beautiful picture of those actual Ten Commandments. Can you imagine what that was like? To, to take up the stones and then have them come back to you? I'm, and what kind of laser finger does God have that he, he can, <laughs> you know, through the stone? I heard my husband on the saw out there the other night uh, in, the, in the garage and I was thinking, you can hear that stone. I wonder what it's like when God turns his laser finger on, writes the Ten Commandments on stone, and he hands them to Moses. Really? I mean, it's real. There are real stones. There's a real guy. There's a real God. There's a real finger writing on the real stones, and he hands them to Moses. I suppose it's important. What do you think? The law of God is a transcript of God's character. It portrays the nature of God as in Christ we behold the brightness of His glory, the express image of His person, so also in the law the attributes of the Father are unfolded. 
That little paper that you have there, we're going to look at some of the attributes. You don't have to look at it now. It's going to be all uh, explained one by one. But it is the law of love. It is the law of love. I didn't think it was the law of love when I was in the Methodist Church and God blessed the Methodists for telling me when I was 12 years old it was time to get confirmed that I should memorize the Ten Commandments. I thought it was a great idea and then I got to number four and I said, we don't do that one. Why should I memorize it? I've already told you that story before. But it's the law of love. Romans 13, 10, if you love others, you'll never do them wrong. To love them is to obey the whole law. And so we're going to start with those uh, commandments that are the ones about how to love people. And we're going to start with honor thy father and thy mother. Now we know, whoops, we know that this goes fast if you're not careful. The fifth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 12. Here's another version of it in the Good News Bible. Respect your father and your mother so that you may live a long time in the land that I am giving you. Respect your father and your mother. Exodus regular, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. You know what? T-H-Y, T-H-E-E, -E, we have made it in English like it's formal. Don't we think that when you talk King James and you say thee and thou that you're being formal? How many people think that? Anybody? Okay, move yourself somewhere if you think that that's formal. Okay, but guess what? In real English, thee and thou was the personal form. Those of you that speak another language, you know, like you have uh, formal forms in uh, Portuguese. What's the formal form of you in Portuguese? Formal. Formal. Like you just met somebody. I don't even know. Okay, <laughs> I'm giving you a hard time. Okay, in French, yeah, I, I knew a little bit of Spanish and that would have been easier, but in French, if, if I just met somebody, in fact, uh, if, if you just meet somebody and you use the family form, like as a woman, if I just met a, a gentleman, um, they would say, the, the, the eyebrows would raise, because there's vous, like you, and there's um, tu, like uh, the. Okay, so if I if I just meet somebody and I'm a tutoyer and then the, the, the why you're speaking so form, so informally to this person that you just met. In English, the you was plural and the you is formal, and the thee and the thou are the intimate, personal ones that you're supposed to use with family. So when you see that thy God giveth thee, he's being personal, and they are and the people that wrote the King James Version knew all that because there'll be places where they'll use the word you when it's, when it's needed. And guess what we have to do because we don't have it in today's English and we're just throwing this out for free. How do you, if you're from New York or Jersey, you're going to say you guys. <laughs> if you're from Ohio or Michigan, you say you guys. If you're from uh, uh, the South, what do we say? Y'all. Y'all. Because we mean, we got to have a plural form of you. Anyway, when you see the, the King James, remember that Jesus is speaking to you personally, intimately, familiarly, when you see thee and I. Oh, why did I go off on that? <laughs> the fifth commandment, for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, where he, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. So the law was supposed to be made known to the children, and um, think about this one. I'm going to go back. Here we have somebody that's actually reading to their children. And, and they're reading the Bible. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to, we were commanded to make them known to our children in Psalm 78, 5. However, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, You father, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So children are to love their parents, and parents are to love their children, and that all is a principle in the fifth commandment. And we thank the Lord for that. So the principles of the fifth commandment is reverence and respect for authority. The first people that you meet and that have control over your life are your parents. And then remember Jesus said that, the, um, that they in vain they do worship me because
because of uh, that one custom that they would give their money to the Pharisees and then, the, then they didn't have to give money, then they didn't have to take care of their parents? Well, this commandment, respect and honor your parents, uh, has to do with taking care of them. Love and peace in the family. When there is a decision to be made and the father has prayed or the mother has prayed, then there's love and peace in the family. And when that love and peace comes, this principle of this fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, is a miniature of God's heavenly family where each gives the other mutual respect. Our sixth commandment is, can you read it? Can you see it? Yeah, sure. Thou shalt not what? Yeah. Kill. So, Exodus, thou shalt not kill. Exodus 20, verse 13. Now Jesus said to them in John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the, read this one with me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. John 10, 10 says, read it. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So the principle of Jesus giving to us about thou shalt not kill is that he's life. And then he proves it. He proves it when he says to Martha and Mary, I am the resurrection and the life, John 11, 25. Amen. And then the wonderful witness of the fact that he rose from the dead. So the principles of the Sixth Commandment are at least this. Life is precious. Life can be eternal in Christ. Only God has immortality. Only God can live, is lived forever. He's from eternity past to eternity future. And God is the life giver. Yeah. Now you can find those all through the Bible that God is life. So when it says that thou shalt not kill, you flip that over. And you find out that God is, Jesus said, I am life. And so whenever you go against life, you're going against God's character. The seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, is going to tell us in Deuteronomy 6, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Why do I put that up about God there? Because in Revelation, we find out that there's a woman who is an adulterer, and she has committed fornication with the nation. She is actually not faithful to God. And so God uses the word uh, adultery to respond to a church that is not faithful to his word. So in the seventh commandment, uh, we find that, that uh, people being unfaithful, to their husband or wife is not God's way. God has told wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as unto the Lord. But then he comes right along, he says, therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so the wives be unto their own husbands. Amen. But husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So in the context of marriage, the New Testament teaches us something about what love is like and how we're supposed to love our people. Oh my, I think this one went fast. Thou shalt not steal. If you're falling asleep, shake the person next to you because you don't want them to fall asleep. They're going to say afterwards, well, I got the paper, but I didn't hear the sermon. I had a friend, that same friend, Dan Collins, he would actually stop his sermon and he'd say, if you see somebody sleeping, give them a little push. They'll appreciate it afterwards. Okay. Thou shalt not steal. Wow, this thing is buzzing by. All right, there's a nice little family. So the principles of the seventh commandment are what? Faithfulness, loyalty, and trustworthy. And when adultery comes into a place, there's that's the trust that's broken. And so you flip that over, and guess what? These are the way God is. He's faithful, he's loyal, and he's trustworthy. You can always trust him. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. That is wonderful. So our next commandment will be number eight, thou shalt not steal. We got this, uh, this tricky thingy. My husband says it's me that does this wrong. All right. Here we go. Thou shalt not steal. So what do you think the opposite of stealing is for, for the character of God? Yeah. <laughs> One more.
point line. <clears throat> John 3.16 was in our, uh, was in our uh, children's story today. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave, Gave his only begotten son. Amen. And uh, as Brother Raymond Joseph told us, it wasn't an offer. It was a done deal. It was a gift God gave. And then John 1.12, but as many received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Our God is a giver. Will you say that? Yeah. Our God is a giver. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, look at this though, he doesn't just stop with salvation. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, heal all manner of sickness and get on all manner of disease. So God gave the healing ministry to his disciples. And this is beautiful too. Um, you know, the five fishes and the loaves, he looks up, he, he, he prays over it. And he gives all this food to everybody. No wonder they wanted him to be king, huh? He's a giver. God's a giver over and over. It just keeps coming out. And then the best book in the Bible for giving us wisdom for the end time, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. God gave us the book of Revelation. Amen. Are we thankful? Amen. Amen. And he gave us talents. Some, you know, five talents, two talents, one talent. But God gives us those talents. Ooh, when you're born, you have a DNA to do certain things that somebody else may not be able to do. And also, when they were up in the New Testament times, those early disciples, they understood what God's giving spirit was, his spirit of love. And when they had stuff, that they didn't need, and even probably some stuff they did need. And they looked over and saw somebody who didn't have some things. What did they do? The last part of that, they sold their possession and goods. They parted or gave them to all men as every man had need. So there was a big sharing going on. Amen? A big sharing. So in the principles of the Eighth Commandment, we have that God is a what? Giver. giver. Take that home with you, would you? God is a giver. The principle of personal property means we have freedom of choice. Now I want you to see that in the thou shalt not steal, you, if, if something doesn't belong to somebody, you can't steal it, right? I know that God said all the cattle on the hill are mine. I know that, that this whole universe is, is his. I also know that, you know, we have basically just got a what? We've got a, a, a lease or a sub, we've been sublet the planet. Um, and uh, Adam sublet it to the enemy. But if there was no personal property, you couldn't steal. And if there's no personal property, you can't give. So when you have, God is put into this, this idea that there is personal property. So then guess what? You get a choice, a freedom of choice, of whether you're going to give or whether you're not going to give. And many times giving is one of the best ways to show what? Love? Yes, love. All right, we're moving right along to commandment number nine. Thou shalt not bear false witness. False witness. So, that's in Exodus 20, 16. Another way of saying it was do not accuse anyone falsely. We usually just dumb it down to you don't lie, right? Don't lie, and you're, and you're fine. But this really has to do with, uh, with defaming someone else's character. And um, Jesus is a witness. He came to be a witness of the light that all men might believe. Remember in the Bible it said that uh, without two or three witnesses, you can't believe anything? So God really wants um, something established. Uh, he wants something established as a witness. How important is the truth to Jesus? How important is the truth to Jesus? He is, he is the truth. He, is truth. he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? Yes. So truth is important to Jesus. Have we got truth in the Bible? Yes. yes. How important is it that you love the truth in the Bible? And there's going to be people try to tell you stuff that's not in the Bible. So we need to love the truth. So 
when it says, I shall not bear false witness, a lot of the people are bearing false witness against God because they don't know what his Bible says. They think that he's burning forever and ever people that are in, that, that did not make the choice to serve him and go to heaven. And that that's going on right now. Is that a false witness against God? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have a horse that goes down, somebody will take a gun and shoot him in the head and put him out of his what? Misery. But we have a God that they're bearing false witness against his character, and they say, oh, no. Our God is going to take us out. We're going to look over and watch these people suffer forever and ever and ever. 